Hey gang. So in statistics, we analyze data. The uh, type of analysis that we do kind of depends on the type of data that we have. So in the next couple of slides, I'd like to talk about different data types and some broad stroke kind of general rules on what we can do with different kinds of data. Um, I guess the, the first thing to just point out from the get-go is that um, there's a, a data or a data set and then uh, a datum. And this is totally pedantic. The, the comic in the bottom of the screen there kind of points out how pedantic this is. Um, a datum is a singular piece of information. right? So if I give you one fact, that is a piece of data, that is a datum. Uh, if I give you a collection of facts or a bunch of observations on different things, then that is a collection of information, a collection of data, or a data set, or data. So, uh, so data is a plural word, so you'll say the data are something or other. Um, if you're talking about a particular piece of information, one specific item, then you would say a datum says this, or a datum is this. Now, uh, hopefully you do have more than one piece of information. So um, data sets will differ by their size. So uh, if you have a very small data set, if you have one observation, there's not much you can do with that. The richer your data set, the more observations that you have, the more nuanced kind of analysis that you can do. Well, we're now in the age of big data where uh, a statistician has access to uh, millions and millions of observations and can really do nuanced analysis. So um, we have different kinds of data sets. Um, we might just be interested in one particular variable. So we could do a univariate analysis, right? That's just one variable, univariate. Um, and we can do simple things with that. Um, we can uh, talk about its, uh, its average. Um, just to see you know, what is the representative value of that data. We can uh, describe how disperse it is. So in other words, um, do most of those observations on that data set, are they within particular ranges or bounds? Um, that kind of descriptive statistic um, is uh, either a standard deviation or a variance. It's a, it's a measure of spread or dispersion. Um, we can talk about how often particular values arise. Um, such a thing is called a frequency table, frequency tally, um, sometimes a, a cross tab. Uh, even if it shouldn't be called a cross tab because cross should tabulate two variables and how they correlate. Um, but in Excel, it's still a, a cross tab. Um, now, speaking of correlation, you might want to know how two particular variables vary together. For example, um, what is the relationship between study time and grade in the class? Those two different variables kind of relate with each other. Or you might want to know what is the correlation between uh, gender and income. And anytime you're going to be doing relating two variables like that and see how they relate, um, you're doing a bivariate analysis. And the simple things that go there are um, correlations and covariances to see how when one variable goes up, the other does what? It does go up or down. Um, graphically, a scatter plot is a great way to do that kind of analysis. It's the, in fact, a, like that's where you should start is a scatter plot. And then you can get uh, much fancier. You can do uh, a regression analysis, which we'll end this course with actually. Uh, and regression is basically you've got a scatter plot, you've got these points, and you're trying to fit a straight line um, that best describes those points. Now you can extend that idea to multivariate analysis. So now you're analyzing the interrelationships between more than two variables, three, four, 20, 50, 100 variables. Now this you can't really graph. I mean, you can graph three variables. You can think of those points from the scatter plot as kind of suspended in midair, and then you're fitting, you know, like a line in midair. Uh, but once you get beyond three variables, you can't do it graphically at all. And that's when you get into some really neat statistical techniques um, where with math, you can, you can analyze multivariate kind of multidimensional problems. Um, you can't graph in 50 dimensions, but you can analyze an equation in 50 dimensions. So that's your multivariate analysis. Now, data themselves uh, come in a bunch of different types. Now, there's a, a whole bunch of different ways you can classify a data set. 
This is just one of them. But it's kind of like me saying the world can be uh, split up into chairs and non-chairs. And this is true, and it might be useful. Um, but maybe a different way of thinking it is the world can be split into tables and non-tables. And maybe in other contexts, that's more useful. Well, in our context, one of the ways of splitting data is what you see in front of you here uh, on this slide. Um, the simplest kind of data um, is cross-sectional. Now, a cross-sectional data set just takes a snapshot of the world in one particular point in time. It's like asking, what is the grade distribution on midterm one? Right, so we took midterm one, and we record the grades, and then we take that snapshot. And we see you know, the high grade was an A+, plus and the low grade was something that was not an A+. Plus. And, and there's some kind of variance. There's an average grade. There's dispersion, so we have high and low grades. The key thing is that if you took that, that data set, you collected it, and it reflects the world at one particular point in time, that is a cross-sectional data set. That's going to be the easiest kind of data set that you can analyze and what we're going to spend all of our time talking about. Now the next step up in that is time series analysis. Now that's when you you don't look at the entire class, all 40 students at one point in time. Time series flips that. Time series says let's track one student and see how that one student varies over time. Now you'll do this in your finance classes where you'll track one particular stock and you'll see whether it's trending up or down or whether it's volatile. That's time series analysis. One particular thing being tracked over time. That has its own separate course. Then you might want to combine features of both. So you don't want to track just one stock, you want to track 50 stocks over time. All right, well that ratchets up the complexity even more. That kind of analysis is called a longitudinal analysis or a panel analysis. A longitudinal data set or a panel data set. And that's kind of like level three stats for our purposes. Now, for us, we're pretty much going to spend our time on cross sections. Okay, so that's one way of splitting up the world of data set, chairs and non-chairs. Here's a different way of splitting it up, tables and non-tables. We can think of data um, not uh, relative to the, uh, the frequency of observation, but the kind of thing being observed. So, for example, we might uh, be interested in uh, whether uh, information is categorical or numerical, uh, qualitative or quantitative. So uh, qualitative could be, um, uh, I don't know, uh, color. Um, qualitative could be uh, whether you, um, you really like a product or you don't like a product or you're kind of neutral. It's qualitative. It's like quality. It's kind of rough. Um, numerical or quantitative data, now that is really easy to do um, statistics on. So if you, can, if you can assign a particular number and that number has meaning, you're looking at quantitative data. Uh, qualitative data is different. Um, here's another example. Um, if you're trying to analyze um, house prices, house prices vary by location. So neighborhood matters. Now, you might have a house in uh, uptown New Orleans versus Lakeview versus Mid-City. Now, you've got three different neighborhoods. And so if you had a spreadsheet of data, you might have a, a neighborhood column. But the information there is whether it's uptown or Lakeview or Mid-City. Now, you could assign numbers to those categories, those three neighborhoods, but the numbers aren't really informative, they're merely labels. And if I choose to rank, um, you know, to, to put a, the number one for Uptown, two for Lakeview, and three for Mid-City, well, there's no real meaning to the fact that one was a three and one is a one. It's not like Mid-City is three times more of anything than Uptown. So in this case, we're using a number as a label. It's reflecting a particular category of thing. But that number itself is not really numerical. At least it doesn't, it doesn't act like a normal number would, where we have magnitude. Okay, so that's quantitative versus qualitative. 
Um, oh, uh, gender, for example, not a dangerous topic these days, but gender is a categorical variable. Um, you're uh, a girl, or you're a guy, or you're undecided, or you're switching, or whatever. But I can assign a number to it, and yet it, there's no way that that number actually reflects a magnitude of something. So if I choose to um, record in my data set um, people as a male or female, I could choose to, um, to record it as a word, male, female. I could choose to record that categories as zeros and ones. But if I do, even though there's a number involved, it's not like that number actually means anything beyond the fact that someone is a member of a particular category. So categorical variables. And there, on the bottom there, I, I mentioned gender. Uh, you can subdivide categorical variables even further, and numerical variables even further. So um, uh, categorical variables can be split up into nominal versus ordinal. Now nominal is, uh, it's just a variable uh, has value in name only. So, um, so if I choose to code gender as um, one if female, zero if male, those are strictly labels. So it's not like the one is one more than the zero or infinite percentage higher than the zero. It's strictly a label. We call those nominal variables. They're a subcategory of categorical. Um, in marketing, sometimes you'll be asked um, whether you uh, agree with something or not on a scale from one to five. Then a five would be something more in magnitude than a four. If you liked it as a five versus a four or a four versus a three, it does mean that you liked it more. But so order is still here, but but it's still not quite as good as like one of these pure numbers. For example, um, if I rated something a five and I rated something else as a one, can I really say that I liked the five five times more than the one? Not exactly, right? All I'm saying is it's more. It's a lot more. But I can't really uh, ascribe a particular magnitude to how much more. Those kind of variables are called ordinal variables. They are often analyzed using the tools of numerical variables. That is uh, a mistake. And usually you shouldn't do such a thing. There are statistical techniques focused just on ordinal variables, where um, if you had measured something as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 50, it works out the same as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because order matters, but not the magnitude. Now going back to numerical, what, what we're going to be spending most of our time on, uh, numerical variables can be split up a couple different ways, discrete versus continuous. So a, a discrete uh, variable can take on a countable number of different things, of different values. So for example, how many siblings do you have? You might have zero, you might have one, you might have two, you might have ten. Heck, you know, you might have twenty. But it's countable, right? So these come in discrete chunks. And you can't really talk about like 2.3 siblings. Yeah, at least not in a comfortable kind of way. Continuous variables uh, can take on an infinite number of different values. So for example, um, your GPA, right? It's bounded between 0 and 4.0, um, but it can be an infinite number in between, right? It can be 3.927, it can be 1.002, or anything in between. Rainfall is another example. Um, it's going to be between zero and I don't know what, you know, potentially an infinite amount of rainfall. But let's say uh, in a particular uh, period of time, 20 inches of rain. But it could be any number in between those two, right? An infinite number of possibilities. It could be 1.23579101011. 1011. Uh, you know, all those decimal points of rainfall, it could be one point. Seven six five four three two one inches of rain. Right? It can be infinite. So in that case, we uh, think of the the data set or that that variable as having a continuous support. It could be 
any of an infinite number of different things. So that's the general, I think, kind of, of way to, to split up data sets. Um, another useful um, way of, of splitting data is into a population versus a sample. And this isn't just useful, this is critical here. See, when we're doing statistics, what we really want to know is something about the world. We usually don't have access to all of the world's information. Or if we did, we might not be able to analyze, in a finite amount of time, the world's information. Now, the, the jargon of statistics is, you want to know something about the world. We'll call that the population. Maybe it's you want to know what average income is uh, or income is in the United States. And so the relevant population there is every resident of the United States. If you wanted to know what income is in the world, then the population becomes the, the world population. If you want to know what um, average income is uh, in Loyola, then the relevant population that you're interested in is students who go to Loyola. So your research question will tell you what the population of interest is. Now, you usually can't digest all the information of the population. You have to resort to taking a sample, which is a small subset of the population. Ideally, that small subset will be representative of the whole, right? So if you want to know what income is like in the United States, you take a sample of 100 people. It is possible that you happen to take a sample of 100 people and they're all billionaires. In which case, your sample wouldn't really represent the true dispersion of income, the population. We'll talk about ways to ensure that the sample reflects the population. Now, related to this distinction between population and sample is parameter versus statistic. The parameter, how we're going to use the word parameter, is it's the population's descriptive variable. So if I want to know average income in the United States, what I'm after is that number for the population, that parameter. I'll take a sample, I'll calculate the sample average, and that sample average I'm going to call a statistic. The statistic is supposed to be representative of the parameter. It's hopefully they're, they're close. But when I'm talking about what's true in the population, I'll use the word parameter. And when I'm talking about a particular thing that I've recorded from a sample, we'll call it a statistic. Okay, so that's it for now. Thanks for watching.